five. Ryan's being weird sure. already, and uh, we'll go from there. It's, so, cooler. Do so you want to start us off? I've matured as a host, <laughs> as a podcaster. Prove it. As a friend. Prove it. As a God-fearing man. And there we go. other, ex- uh, yeah. you know, really interesting things in life because we are back with the Team GPT podcast. I am your host, Syed. I'm here with my good friends, Ryan and Brian, as always. And today we have a special guest, Mike. Mike, throwing you in the hot seat. Tell us about yourself. What's going on? Yeah, um, a lot. It's been a busy couple of years. Um, I'm the owner of SMG Powerlifting. Um, I came out of retirement to uh, compete in the uh, my first Masters meet. Uh, you know, I'd taken, I had taken – I had a run where – uh, I, we had kids. I gained a lot of weight. Got really strong because I got fat. Um, competed in the 242 weight class, and uh, you know, hit some numbers I'd never hit before. And then uh, I started to cut. Did one last meet at 220. Hit some pretty good numbers. And I was like, you know what? I think I'm done powerlifting. Just gonna chill with the kids and um, take uh, not compete anymore. So I, t- I took a full year off. Like I didn't step in the gym. I went from my heaviest at 250 all the way down to like 195. Um, wow. and one day on Instagram, I saw like, uh, Lane Norton was posting that he was like destroying everyone in the M ones, the 93s. And I was looking at the numbers and I was like, you know, I could probably take a run at this. Um, so I started training and did like a quick eight week block, did a qualifier and then went to nationals and, uh, um, we got it down to the last deadlift, but he, he eked me out on deadlifts there, um, by one, uh, he ended up beating me by, I think one pound, um, so yeah, that so one, that was so yeah that that one I like I, said, I wrote everything down before so like that one he beat you by like two and a half kilos two, uh, two and a half yep uh, yeah but so you did you did a, a qualifier meet and then eight weeks later you did nationals and then eight weeks later you did NAPS yeah and eight <laughs> weeks before the qualifier I, I had taken a year off after <laughs> after, losing, after losing fifty pounds so that was it was kind of a crazy crazy six months and I um. Yeah, I was in a lot of pain for six months straight, basically. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I think the first thing with that is like people can take a little bit of time off and come back, and you're going to be fine. Like, you're not going to you're not going to lose everything just because you take you know a week off of training. Right. <laughs> um, I'm going to try to jump right into like the numbers. Like I said, I went through before. I mean, like at nationals, um, you slightly outweighed him, but like by a pound. Um, yep. But yeah, it came down like it. it you um, you. If you hit your last deadlift, he, um, you had, a, you would have been in a tie, uh, but he would have won on body weight. Um, but I mean, that meet you out squatted Lane by ten kilos. Uh, for anyone that doesn't know Lane Norton that we're talking about, Lane is a two or three time Open national champion too, um, yeah. and he had uh, come in second, I believe, at Open Worlds, um, and now he's competing in the Masters division. Um, so yeah, so you out squatted him that meet by ten. Uh, he out benched you by seven and a half and he out pulled you by five. So he ended up winning by um, two and a half. Um, but then two months later, you guys basically same weight, really didn't change anything. Um, you actually squatted two and a half less than you did at nationals. There's a he squatted that. <laughs> yeah. And then you, but, but you benched, you went three for three. You hit your, the third bench that you missed at nationals. Mm-hmm. He hit the same bench, but this is the big one. Like this, is what I was looking at before was like, I mean, he, I don't think people would understand this. It's like he actually Lane went up eleven kilos in the two months. You went up thirteen. Yep. So I mean, like, I mean, you 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 know you missed a three twelve deadlift at nationals, then you hit three twenty one at NAPF. So I I think like for me, it's a big thing. It's like what was the difference between those two meets? Yep. So other than that, you got a little bit more training in. Yeah. So there was a couple things. So before my qualifying meet. Um, I basically had, I think it was 12 weeks actually before my qualifying meet from the time I had taken off the first four weeks back, I was just doing my own thing and my training did not look like normal training. Um, people in the gym laugh at me cause I would come in, hit a top AMRAP set and then be like, all right, I'm done and leave. And, um, you know, at a certain point, like that worked when I was getting fat. Um, but now that I was trying to do a lot with like, um, you know, staying, uh, at a lighter weight, it, it wasn't a good plan. So I hired um, Jonathan Keiko as my coach and he's like the mm-hmm. open 93 champ. And he drastically changed my training to be like more volume focused. 
Um, so for the eight weeks leading into um, into Nats, I had switched to to um, to that kind of training, um, and my body wasn't even fully like adapted to that kind of thing. So I was mm-hmm. I was basically in pain from the qualifier to Nats like every day, just because my body wasn't adapted to the volume. Right. But I was still able to hit the loads. It's just I wasn't my I just didn't have the adaptiveness. Um, so going into my third deadlift at nationals, my back actually was cramping from benching and from the second deadlift. And we made a strategical error because Lane didn't know that. And my second deadlift looked pretty good. It looked like mm-hmm. a second deadlift should. But I, after I stepped off the platform, I was like, I don't think I have another pull. Like even if I had to okay. do this, even if I had to do the same way, I don't think I could do it again. And my wife was handling me. We didn't really like strategize begin the situation. So we put two and a half in. So he just had to chip. Like he just had to put whatever gotcha. he thought yep. to, to beat me. Whereas if I had played the game and like put in a high number, right, then he would have to go first, and then, you know, who knows right. what he would have put in. He probably still would have won, but strategically, um, mm-hmm. I knew I didn't have a third deadlift. Um, so, so the big difference after nationals was I had more time to do the volume, so my body was better conditioned. But I also switched to sumo from conventional. Okay. So it was a combination of those two. Um, because what I found over the years, especially when I'm a lighter weight, my back gets a lot of fatigue from benching and from conventional um, and from squatting, obviously, too. Um, so the sumo gives me more endurance, basically. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So more time with the volume and the switch to sumo helped a lot. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because like I said, I, I – go ahead. I was going to say, because going to nationals, I had the strength to pull, you know, 700 or, you know uh, – I forget what the number was, but 700, 705. But mm-hmm. um, endurance-wise, I just I, I didn't have the just one there. Yeah. Yeah, and that's like I as I said when I was looking at it before, it was interesting because like I the first thing that stood out to me was that your squat was, I mean, two and a half kilo difference is effectively the same, but you opened twelve and a half kilos lighter at APFs. Uh, yeah. You made a big jump, and then you made another good size jump. So I think like I was like, oh, that probably saved some energy, and that's what I figured was like. Know, give you a little bit more energy for the other lifts and then you hit all three benches and then the the crazy thing is like you look at the deadlifts is like every attempt that you and lane made that day was a a record attempt yeah they were like both open yeah yeah like he opened at 288 you went to 90.5 he went to 308 which he had pulled at nats you went to 308.5 yep. you went to 320.5 he went to 321 mm-hmm. so i mean six attempts six records and yep. literally just bouncing back and forth on who's going to win. And then you end up winning by the half a kilo because of that world record attempt or the NAP ref record attempt. Um, yeah. Yeah. So a couple things. Um, so I had planned if he had missed his third deadlift, and I think I had it, the, the IPF world record is uh, 325. And okay. I, I, think, I think on that day I had it. Um, I would have chipped that. But yeah. obviously, obviously it didn't make sense to go for that if I just needed uh, right. half a kilo on him. Um, then the other thing with the squat, uh, my squat was lower. It was lower across the board, and the issue I had was I came into that meet a little heavier, and the cut mm-hmm. was the cut was bad. The cut was really bad. Oh, uh, okay. Um, we were in Cayman Islands, and so I yeah. didn't have easy access to certain amenities like a uh, sauna and stuff. So I woke up in the morning. I was still a kilo and a half up over. Um, so I had a mini panic attack, and you know, put on my. <laughs> my uh track suit and started walking outside in the heat for basically like an hour um i did like sixteen thousand steps on my 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 tracker mm-hmm. so I actually my feet start to blister and my back was cramping when i uh when i finally made weight and uh, i was the la- i was the second to last person to weigh in and i basically <laughs> had an hour to recomp <laughs> so yeah that was why um my squat was down but gotcha but, but i i like rec- i recomped well it's just um i just needed time yeah yeah. So did you like if if that hadn't happened, would you do you think you would have squatted way more that day? We yeah. So um, Susie uh, Gary was my handler, um, mm-hmm. and we had planned that my third squat was going to be something in the two ninety range, which is okay. thirty eight. Um, so that I think that that would have been there not without the uh, circumstance of the cut. Okay. Uh, yeah, and that that would have obviously changed the whole meet if I if I hit that, but. Right, yeah. If you were another seven and a half kilos ahead, it might yeah. not have even mattered at that point. Yeah. So, um, like, yeah, it was kind of a miracle that I even hit the the six twenty two. I, I mean, the way I felt was was pretty bad. Um, yeah, it, was, it, was, it wasn't good. Sixteen thousand steps before you weighed in. Yeah. 
Yeah, my 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 feet were blistering from like sweating and walking, and my uh yeah. my my traps were cramped, like cramping up. Um, that sucks. Yeah, it was it was not good. <laughs> That's why. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, we were in a foreign place. I didn't. Yeah, you know, it was like right. six a.m. It's like, where do I go for a sauna? Like, uh, just, just sprint on the just, beach. Yeah, with walk. a hoodie. Yeah. Yeah. So that was a miscalculation on my part, and I, I, I'm a notoriously bad cutter, so I should probably stop doing that. Just go up. And that's I was going to segue into that. Um, so Lane and I are one on one right now. We had planned to kind of have the rubber match at Nationals or Worlds this year, and uh, I think I'm going to move up. Um, so right now I'm registered for Open Nationals as a 105. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, Is there anyone in the 105? So Mike. To push Mike... you. Yeah. So Ashton and Mike Davis are in the 105. So I'm going to get. Oh, you're talking about the Open. Yeah, I'm in the Open. Yep. So I'm going to crush okay. by those two. But nice. I think there's there's a good chance I can come in third or fourth. So the podium at you know I'm 41 years old in the Open. Yeah. My first my first meet at 105 would be pretty cool. Right. Um, now are you doing master as well? Oh, with it? No, because those two meets are split up now, right? They're split. So I would have okay. to do I would have to do a separate meet, meet as masters. And the person to push me in that is uh, Ellis McLean. Oh he's yeah, like, for, he's yeah, like a, I forget that Ellis is up again. Yeah. Yeah, he's like a six time world champion. So yeah, yeah, you're fucked anywhere you go. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not a walk in the park. I mean, look at his numbers. He started to drop off a little bit. Um, he's he's older than me. He's I think 45. Um, so I I don't know what his reason that his numbers have dropped a bit. They're within yeah, range, but it would be tough. Your squat and uh, deadlift would be right there with him. He, he outbenches you because um, I think his best in competition is like 505 or something like that. Yeah, that's, no, I mean, you know, uh, that's just I'm, not real, though. Also, no. like for a 93, because he, he hit like it was, he chipped it. It wasn't 227, it was like 228, 229, something like that at 93. Like, that's just a crazy number. Um, yeah. I know LS, uh, he had a kid a few years ago, too. So I'm sure that has something to do with numbers being a little bit different. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, yeah, I think his, I think at Worlds he totaled around 1800. Okay. Which is, which is kind of my goal for um, Nationals this year at 105. Okay. So I think, I think I'll be there with him. I, I haven't decided if I'm going to do Nationals because it's just a lot. You know, we have we have twins. They're young. I have a full time job, so it's hard to take um, multiple trips. You know, especially it's it's two months right. apart too. Um, open Nationals in March and Masters in May, I think. And then and, and and then and then NAPF is like August or October, like right, right around the world. So I I could probably do either a Masters Nationals or NAPFs again. We'll we'll see. I don't think I'll do both. Yeah, it's such a tough thing. Just the the, the schedule we talked about for years and trying to figure out how to align everything to to make it better so people can compete and have time to train. And yeah. it's just it's almost impossible. There's so many big meets, and because so many of them are split up, it's it's tough to be able to get that time frame of like of how can you actually get you know a full training cycle without having to just go back to back meets. That's yeah. tough. Like that's you know we've been dealing with that for as long as I've been in the sport. Uh, there's not a whole lot we can really do. Yeah, there. and the tough part is they they don't pick lifter friendly locations, especially for worlds. No. So, no. Yeah, I mean, uh, worlds last year or this in 2023 was in Mongolia. So yeah, I mean that like, come on. it that's three days of travel each way basically, like be right. between all the connections and stuff. And then worlds next year is in South Africa, which isn't that Super bad. Close. It's it's a, it's like a little twelve hour flight, but then you have to take like a three hour bus ride through right. like through like the like Nowheresville, which I've heard was uh, sketchy. So I don't know. It's um right. That's a, I, I remember when when Kim Walford was back at our at our gym when she was still in Connecticut, and the first she went to Suzdal, Russia, and everyone's like, "Where's Suzdal?" And they landed in <laughs> Moscow, and they had like a four hour van ride. And like the yeah. whole team poured into the van and they had some Russian driver that had the heat pumping. <laughs> so all the lifters were sweating and they were like, they're doing this on purpose. They were freaking out about it. <laughs> and they finally got to Sozdel. And it's like, you know, I at least if you're going to have it in, in Russia, at least have it in Moscow. Yeah. Uh, right. Like I said, South Africa, it's not even in Johannesburg. I think it's in, it's in Pochfram or something like that. It's not. Yeah. I, all I know is it's a three, a three or four hour bus ride <laughs> um, after a 12 hour flight. So right. you're, you're, looking, you're looking at a full 24 hours to get there and back. Um, and I just, you know, I can't be gone. Like, and for it to make sense, I have to get there probably three days early, right? Right. So it's a full week, basically, of travel at that point. Yeah. And it's just not realistic. Um, so that was one of the, that was the other driver where I'm like, 
going to Worlds is 93. It's probably I'm probably not going to go to Worlds anyway. So even mm -hmm. if I won Nationals, so why am I going to right kill myself to try to make weight and like do all this when I could just get stronger, do 105s, and see what happens, right? I mean, right. Plus, NAPFs is usually great places to go to go lift. NAPFs this year is I think Arizona, which is not bad. Oh, that one was yeah. not yeah. But I mean, yeah. in the past, you've like NAPFs has been in Costa Rica. It's been in. Yeah, can't... Uh, like just, you're, you're in Grand Cayman. Like it's it's usually in a really good location. Um, yeah. So a lot of people would rather go to NAPF than go to Worlds. Yeah, Grand Grand Cayman was great, and actually there was a good turnout. There was a lot of big lifters there. It was a uh, it was a cool meet. Yeah. Oh. So I mean, I think the switch to sumo and the and the weird situation before and is probably made it fairly easy on on how this kind of played out. Um, but like I said, I, I was talking to someone before the fact that, you know, that he was able to add 11 kilos and you still came back, uh, you know, and pushed ahead for the win as, is like a huge difference. And, um, again, like Lane was a two or three time open national champion and he's gone to world. So that, that's a big, like when Tim, like Tim mentioned, like, I don't think people realize like Lane's a big name. Everyone, like a lot of people in the sport know who Lane Norton is. Nothing against you. I don't know how many people know who you are. Yeah, not many. Um, but like, but when you go out and beat Lane, they should know who you are. Yeah, you know, and, and it was they... it was cool because the king of the lifts actually reposted reposted me. Powerful America reposted me. Um, but you know, I was gonna say like competing against him is it's hard. It's harder than you think. Like, like the numbers the numbers don't even mean anything because he's so intense. Like when you're there. You know, I'm not I'm not a loud guy, right? Like I'm sitting there, like just thinking about my lifts and like whatever. And he's screaming, pacing, running back and forth, like yelling. And the thing is, like he just doesn't miss. Like whatever he puts on the bar, he's gonna lift it. Like in it might take ten seconds, but he's yeah. gonna get it. Well, and that's it's hard to get a read on him too, because his he'll hit his opening deadlift, and you're like, oh, he doesn't have much left. And right. then he'll he'll jump thirty kilos and hit it, and then jump another twenty and hit that. And I'm like, <laughs> like how? It just doesn't make sense, but. Um, it, it helped a lot to have Susie in my corner because she was, I just, she just handled everything. I just went and lifted mm -hmm. the weight, but knowing that you're facing someone who's just not going to miss is, is, it makes it tough. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. No, like, I mean, is it, and like with the NAPF, so you said your squat was a little bit off from what you planned. Was yep. the bench in line or did that change too? The bench, we, we had our kind of base case plan is 368. Um, okay. after my second, I was like, you know what? I don't want to go out on missing a bench again. So we played safe with 363. 368 would have been sketchy. Um, it was probably mm -hmm. right to make the 363 play. And then deadlift, my, my top end was was pretty high that day. I think I had 725 probably. Okay. Yeah. I think well, like you said, like, it, right. Like, it, and that's where I, I was. So we, the Connecticut State Championship meet is coming up in March. Yep. And what's really interesting is like, we've got 10, 100 kilo lifters that are all like pretty good. So they're all yep. going against each other. So it's going to be fun with that. But we were saying how they're all in that kind of situation where if someone misses a squat or a deadlift, they could go from first to sixth. Yeah. Like yeah. in no time. And like you said, like, you know, at 321, I mean, it'd be cool to have the world record. But like if you went for that world record and missed. Yeah. And yeah. then you ha then you lose and don't have the world record. Like there's a time and a place for things. And we were saying like with the with the Connecticut meet, a lot of guys are going to be trying to qualify for nationals anyway because the qualifier now is a lot higher. Um, so I think some people might be playing it safe to try to get that 740, which is going to let some other people kind of make – hopefully take a jump and try to go for that – go for the win. Um, right, right. Which if they go for the win, they're going to qualify anyway. Um, but no, it's like – and that's why I was, it, was, it was interesting because like when you looked at – when you because I wasn't – I watched the meet when you lifted. But mm -hmm. looking at it like on the score sheet, you know, again, like you – since your deadlift was just a little bit heavier each time, like obviously you were going after them. So you knew what you had to do, which is a huge benefit. Mm -hmm. Like, like, you know, if, if we're in, in, like you said, in the first meet, when you put in the three twelve, even if you hit it, at least he knew exactly what to do too. So it's always nice to have that deadlift in your pocket to be able to pull it out. But like I said, like, you know, it'd be cool to, if you hit more, but yeah. And I, I think taking away the power of him pulling last was huge because he gets yeah. so much out of that height. Um, cause I know if, if there was seven ten load on the bar, he would have hit, like if he was pulling last, he would hit it. So I, mm -hmm. I had lot, I had lot number advantage, which helped. Um, 
So yeah, we went into deadlifts tied, and I had a lot number advantage, so I was going last. So right, that def that That's definitely right. had a big effect. Right, and I figured, like I said, I didn't, I couldn't. When I was looking at the results, I could, I couldn't find lot numbers listed. So I just assumed that based on nationals, the way it was set up, that you probably didn't have lot number. I uh, he probably had lot. At yeah, nationals, he probably had it. I think so. Yeah. And then, like, said... and then, okay. and the NAPFs, I assumed you had it because, like, the way the way it was kind of set up, it looked like, you know, that even though you were chipping him a little bit each time, it looked like you had that advantage with the lot number. And like, and that's one that I don't think a lot of people realize, but having that number too, because then you could have, you know, and I, and I know Susie's one of the best, Matt gets all the attention, but Susie's just as good a game day coach yep. um, that they would have known what to put on the bar to like, to play the game a little bit, to, but also make sure that you've got the right number of the bar to win. Yep. Yeah. And, and, um, and that's at, at NAPF, Susie had two cards filled out. It was basically, yeah. You know, seven, uh, what was seven, 707 was 321. She had that filled mm -hmm. out and then 325 if he missed for the world record. Right. So she already had those. She was handing in depending oh, on what yeah. he did. Um, yeah. So that, I mean, that takes a lot of stress off, off of me. Like, not even have to think about it, you know. Right. Just go pull it on the bar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's the same. Like, and that's what I do the same thing as, like, you know, and, and I learned from the two of them years ago. It was like, you put in the third attempt, you know, try to put in a third one that's going to be strategic. But at the same time, you have your two changes. Mm -hmm. So I would have two cards filled out all the time. So you put in that strategic number, and then hopefully you just pay attention. And hopefully you have the, like you said, like you, you have that deadlift where you can get away with it. Yeah. Um, so it, it helps a lot to have, you know, having a lot of numbers great, but if you don't have the deadlift, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Um, but for you to have that, that deadlift in, in your pocket where you can, you know, especially like I said, like if he decided to go, he went from 308 to 320, if he jumped another three keys – because he could have for the world record like at least you could have, you could have seen what he did mm -hmm. and then made made the adjustment and go for it yep yeah and i know he's going after that world record too because he went after it at uh worlds i think last year and he missed it mm -hmm. so i know it's in his head that yeah, i'm sure there was a number in his mind that he wants um right. but it, it wasn't the right place for either of us to try it um mm -hmm. another another interesting thing I, I know we're talking a lot about lane but there was a third competitor uh gabriel garcia mm -hmm. he had won he had won worlds several times um right and he he was on our heels too his issue was he got he missed two squats yeah um, he, he's a big big squatter so if he hit two out of at least two squats he would have been right there with us he would have, he would have been a lot closer yeah 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 because he he, Cause has he a bigger, ended up not being he, he, he has a bigger, not being that close no no he he has a bigger but, bench than us and bigger squat but he missed two squats on the bench so he was he was out of it but he was he was on our radar for sure like he could have been right there Right. And I, like, like, that's like, I, like when I'm coaching someone at that level is like, usually I have a list of everyone that we're paying attention to and you kind of like start crossing people off as they, as they fall away. Yeah. Um, and that's, yeah. I mean, like that's the interesting thing to be in the squatter is like, if you, if you don't squat well, you could be done, you know, right away. Yep. Um, Cause yeah, you're right. Like if he, if he went three for three, you guys might have had to pull more. Yeah. Like you might have been forced to pull more. Yeah, his op his opening squat was my third squat, basically. Yeah. So <laughs> um so yeah, if he if he ended up with like a, a three hundred kilo squat or something or three oh five, that would have been right interesting. But we we actually did make a strategical error too with um the squats and um we could have put Lane in a slightly worse position if we had thought of it, but Gabriel hit six twenty two point eight, which was my my third squat. But mm -hmm. he missed the second and third, so his best squat was six twenty two point eight. So right. I could have actually I could have actually chipped that because that was an NAPF record. So if I had chipped that, oh I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. So if I had chipped that, I would have gone into deadlifts up on lane by a chip. Right. Uh, so yeah, and and another half a kilo or a kilo on that wouldn't have changed the results, right? So. Right. If you had, I mean, if you had two eighty three on the bar, that I'm sure that would have been fine. Is it a two eighty two? Yeah. yeah, it wasn't a uh, max effort lift. Um. So. So yeah, that was that was one like learning experience that, like just keep an eye on that. Like we didn't even, it wasn't even our head because he was so far ahead on the squat that, but when he missed we the just second assumed, two, yeah. yeah. When he missed the second two, we could have chipped him on that. Right. That's tough though. Cause like you said, like you, you would have had a major call after your second one and he still, and he was going after you. So you assume he's going to hit it on his second attempt. Right. Right. 
No, yeah, you could have, he, I mean, you could have put in 283 and then he would have gone, you know, 300. <laughs> like it, the record, right. it, it wasn't, like you said, it wasn't really on the radar. Exactly. He could have gotten it, but it would have been taken away in 20 yeah. seconds. Yeah. Um, and, and because he missed his second on depth, we thought he was going to get it on his third anyway. So, right. But then he, I think he tried to go deeper on his third. And I'm pretty sure he, he didn't get up with it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's, that's the, the thing with chips is interesting. Um, because like any, I mean, any chip you can take is like, is hugely beneficial. Um, I know like Brian just had that with Devin yeah. at the American Pro. Like they allowed them to chip state records. Oh, really? So even though it was like this big pro meet, like, cause I, like Devin's second attempt or third attempt bench was like 185.5 or something like that, 186. Yeah. Yeah. I would just take him. And I was like, what? And I'm seeing it on the scoreboard. I'm like, how are they chipping? What are they, like, he's not breaking a record. And it was in a Connecticut record that they let him beat. So he was allowed to chip and that, you know, anytime you can take it. Chip, take it. It made it fun. I mean, that's what I was going to ask you was like going in, knowing that there was going to be a lot of times where you guys could ship. Did you have like, numbers in mind either just to hit for yourself or to to push other people like did did Susie like say like hey we're gonna go this because i know gabriel i can hit this it'll push and do this we we did but because because of the cut situation um like any squat plan was kind of out the window i was like i just yeah. want to go three for three let's just right. pick safe no like this was below my plan b numbers you know like like just because it was it was such a taxing event to mm -hmm. to be there um so we, we knew that hopefully by the time deadlifts came around, we'd be recomped and feeling better. Mm. So we're like, let's just go into deadlifts, go six or six, and then um, try to try to win it that way. Um, but ahead of time, you know, I'd spoken to Jonathan and Susie on a, on a call and we had, we had planned out um, like numbers for everything, you know, mm. but uh, reality is always different than, you know, even the best laid plans. Right. Yeah. So I, yeah, but like, I, I'm, Again, it worked out for you. It's you know, like you said, if you hit, if you hit another seven and a half keys, it would have just been an easier day. You probably would have taken a shot at that world record anyway because you probably would have had it already. You, know, you probably yeah. would already had the the win. Um, but like you said, if like a lot of people won't make that change, and you could have opened as heavy as you had, and then maybe you would have been ten kilos behind too. So, mm -hmm. and th and that's what I try to like explain to people is like the. Like a smaller local meet, go for the record. Who cares? You know what I mean? Like if you come in second, but you break a record, that's cool. But like at NEPFs, IPFs, you know, national championship, like win the meet. Like yeah. that's first and, and foremost win. And and that's the funny thing is um I think Lane posted like someone I, I was reading the comments and someone's like, Oh, if I was there, I would have won. And it's like you have no idea <laughs> what goes into this. Like right. it's it's IPF Show judging. Up, it's IPF judging. You're against a competitor who doesn't miss, like like, are these the best number, like the best total like I put up? No, it's the number. It's like the best total I could put up to win, though, right? Like, it's right. You, it, it's it's funny though when people say that. It's like, well, then why aren't you here if that's the case? Um, right. It's awesome. But, someone just flat out said that. Like, yeah, I yeah, they're like, no, won. yeah. Like, if I was there, I would have won. That's yeah. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> it's like some random guy who doesn't even have an open powerlifting or something. So. Hell yeah. That was me. Yeah, was <laughs> I, I said that. <laughs> <laughs> just gotta drop a few kilos. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, so it's, it's, you... it's. I was gonna say it's crazy to see like the the guys in the open, like uh, like my coach Keiko and some of these other guys who are always in battles, like, and still putting up world record totals. Like to do that in those circumstances after right. traveling, even yeah. like even after traveling and stuff is, I mean, it's a whole nother level, right? I mean, yeah, wow. that's what people don't understand. It's like you know, you do a local meet, either like you know your place, my place, like you know it's you're used to it or maybe you're a 20 minute drive from home. That's not a big deal, mm -hmm. but to get on a plane where you're probably going to be bloated yep. and then you're probably going to swell up anyway from the, from the pressure. And then you're going to travel and the time change might be there. Yep. There's a whole lot and food, and cut, might, you know, you cut it. Yeah, you're cutting, you might not have your normal food. You're just not used to the environment. Like so many things can change that to hit the numbers that they do, like you said, at that level, or even like you said, like you hitting those numbers, like it's just, it's, it's a very different thing than doing them in the gym. And I don't, yeah. I think a lot of people don't understand that. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's where local meets like blow it out, go for it. That's for, you know, for fun. Um, but these big meets you have to win and to be able to put up a total that is still better at a meet where you're doing all those things. And like you said, like with Keiko, like, you know, traveling all over the world and then usually winning on a second deadlift. Cause this third is just for, just for fun at that point. 
Yeah, but he's uh, he's usually in a situation where if he misses one or two lifts, he's gonna come in like you were saying, right. come, he'll come in fourth, right? Right. So. And just and like and for him, and he's the he's the probably the oddball in the fact that his bench is so wild. Yeah. That I, I you know most people can't win a meet on bench. You can lose a meet with a bad bench, but his bench helps him. I mean, he's like. I think it's like 5'10", 5'12". No, I think 5'23 last that. year, maybe. Yeah, he's more than He'll be in the 5'30s, I think. Yeah, and, crazy. And it, was, and it was funny. It was one of the reasons I picked him as a coach. Like, I actually know him. We, we used to play League of Legends together. But um, I picked him as a coach because he's such a good bencher. I'm such a bad bencher. So I'm like, oh, he's got to have some kind of magic trick. And it's there's really no trick to it. It's just um, he just benches often and, like, a lot of volume. Uh, not There's no like not a lot of variation, just a lot of comp compresses. Yeah. You know, he's also built like a barrel. Yeah, that's true. So I mean, you can't, like, you can't you know, teach that. <laughs> yeah, like to have shorter arms and a chest that goes on for ever helps. But he still, um, but he still deadlifts. Uh, he'll be pulling close to eight. So I know it's not. I it's and not that's fair. What I tell him, like the people at the top don't have a bad lift. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things I love about powerlifting is that generally you're going to have one lift that maybe stands out and one lift that's not as good. But those guys, like, there's no, there's no bad lift. Yeah. You know, it might be one that they're they're a little bit worse at than the other one. But you're right. I mean, he's putting up the, his numbers across the board. Are I think he's top three in, every, in each individual lift, mm -hmm. and then you know, he was number one in bench. I think he's in, I think he's top three in both in the squat and the deadlift, and then he totals he out totals everybody. Yeah. So yeah, that's the first just crazy. The first lifter I remember that really stood out to me for that was like John Hack back in the day. Mm -hmm. Um, like. He doesn't look like he should be a big bencher, but he has like a ridiculous Huge bench, bencher. and he's high bar squats, and he still has yep. a crazy squat, and then his deadlift's just ridiculous too. So, um, yeah, I guess that's what it takes well, you, though to be the best, right? And you competed against him at prime time in Atlanta, right? I I competed with him a couple times. Actually, my first meet with him, I did Raw Unity back in 2015. <laughs> okay. Uh, back in it was like in Florida. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we were both in the 80. Was it 82.5? Yeah. 21. And I think we competed, uh, like you said, in Atlanta too. It was one, uh, I forget which nationals, but yeah. So I think we competed twice. Yeah, because I think Atlanta was the first prime time when Josh put that one up. Josh Rohr ran that one. I think that was, that was the first prime time. And I, yes. like, that was, I remember that one. And then I think he moved, he won Worlds that year or the next year. Yep. And then moved on from there. But mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I mean, that kind of explained everything I wanted to go over. What about you guys? <laughs> Syed, have you been having a good time just listening? Yeah, man. Listening is fun. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm, I'm, um, for someone who's been in the podcasting game for as long as me, sometimes you learn you got to listen. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> podcasting is more about listening than talking. <laughs> um, well, I had a question. Like, so after, after the first meet, you said you went right back into training and the volume was just as high, just kind of back to the... Uh, to training as hard did, did anything change in the training or was it just like you had longer to do the same training was there like an intention or anything or was it just like i have longer i'm gonna work harder i have you know well so i, I don't know if, how familiar you guys are with like that style of training it's like very much like the the joey flex type uh mm -hmm. like everything's there's a lot of volume but nothing's over like ever rp8 like rp8 mm -hmm. is considered like a high intensity day right right um, gotcha. So you're just constantly putting in a lot of work, mm -hmm. and I think I just needed that, like, two three months to get accustomed to it. Um, and then I also switched. I think originally I had two squat days, and I switched um, one squat day to and to a high bar day. So I was doing one low bar, one high bar, because mm -hmm. I always get bad like elbow tendonitis and that kind of stuff. But we didn't make any major changes. Um, it was just just giving myself more time. And now that I've kind of uh, gained a little bit of weight after the meets and with the holidays and like knowing I'm going to go up to 105, like almost all those pains are gone. Right. I feel so much yeah. better. My numbers are like going up very fast. Um, so it's, it's just a matter of getting used to it. I think, um, okay. yeah, going from no training to, to low volume to then like high volume all of a sudden was a, uh, an adjustment, but yeah, just especially time. with everything else you just said too. That's a lot at once. In a very yeah. short period of time, so I, I yeah. can see that going into like a, a lot of volume like that would be crushing. Yeah. Um, back before, like in the, like when I was doing the USAPL nationals, like in 2015, 2016, I was, I was coached by Mike, Mike T. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, high volume wasn't necessarily completely foreign to me, but it's been a while. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. So I was doing like RTS and that kind of training for I think four or five years. So a lot of like a bulk of my strength, base strength was built from that. Okay. So it's kind of getting back to those roots. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm curious to see what I'll, I, I, I think I'll be able to put up something decent at 105. And uh, what I, do you I weigh right now? I'm around 220. So, okay. So I'm so kind of, you're, you're, you're easily in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'll try to, I'll try to put my pedal, the pedal on to the floor a bit before nationals. I don't want to weigh in too light, but I also don't want to just, Go up to 232 for no reason right right um, yeah do it do it fuck it <laughs> well i mean i've been 250 before so i i the thing is my squat blows up like i've hit uh 7 705 squat at 242 um just because it's having that that giant yeah. core is like such a, a hack on squats so yeah just makes that's it the so secret much. hack it's just it, it's yeah it's just get big just get big but it usually hurts deadlift yeah yeah, yeah. i mean my my deadlift was better at the heavier weight, but it's, it would not like not proportionally. It was maybe only right, you know, two two three percent better. Whereas my squat was like ten percent better, right? Yeah. Um, two forty two seems to be like that magic number where over that deadlift starts to get a little bit weird. Yeah, leverage you start wise. To see where like yeah, you see like you know the 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 guys the one twenties the three like in our in USA belt now the one forties and stuff like you really start to see that line kind of level out with deadlift and sometimes drop a little bit. Or for squat, it just takes off once they start getting bigger. Yeah, I mean, unless you're in that 300 pound range. Unless you're Jesus and you just manhandle 900 pounds. That doesn't count. That's not allowed. (laughs) Right. At the Sheffield, when when they called the 903, we were like, okay, let's see. And then did it at RPE 6. And it was like, okay. (laughs) (laughs) Like, that's that was mind boggling. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, Yeah, different. So did. I I thought of something. Did you um you, you actually watch the NAPF stream? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. I heard I, I heard that it was very uh, in and out. Uh. Any any uh, idea why why they can never get this right? I mean, I feel like every stream I watch, <laughs> there's some kind of issue or it's just displayed poorly. I like I feel like that's really holding powerlifting back. Yeah, I think like I mean, so we we've been streaming all of our meets recently, and I don't have a clue what I'm doing. <laughs> so we've had issues going like, and the first thing we now, again, we're in a small gym, we have 6,000 square feet. So it's not as hard for me to set up. Um, and I have every, like, we have a meet two days. <clears throat> I have everything set up pretty much already. Um, the big one is you just, you have to run so much cabling. Like ev- now that I've wired everything, I have everything hardwired either through cat six or HDMI. It's way better than it was before. Yep. But I think finding reliable internet in a lot of places is really difficult. And I think that's causing a problem and it's not, you know, we're not on the level of big time sports. Yeah. So we're not getting these, you know, uh, we're not getting NBC to come in and record everything. We're doing it kind of on our own and none of us have that capability. So it's always kind of, it's iffy. Yeah. I mean, any PF there were times where it just was like, yep, there's nothing going on or it would freeze. Yep. Yeah. I think my whole you know, third for, deadlift, all the third deadlifts, I think got cut out. Yeah. So just nothing would happen. And the same, I mean, honestly, like not, poking on the Sheffield, but like even the Sheffield at the beginning, they had a bunch of issues where things were just not, not caught up to each other. Like the lights weren't popping up and like, we're looking around and be like, well, what was that a good lift or not? Yep. Um, I think if there's a lot involved with the technology there, and I think we need to get people that aren't in powerlifting, we need to get video people and technology people to come in and start doing more of this. Um, and I think that's the only way it's going to get better. Um, and just the amount of, you know, the, the amount of money to go into that. You know, like yep. the first live stream we did, we literally just, I just took an iPad, put it up and hit Facebook live. And it was <laughs> terrible. Um, now we, have, now we've got like three Sony vlogging cameras set up and a switcher and HDMI cables all over the gym. And it's, and the, the live stream's way better, yep. but there's still times where it's like, I don't know what's going on. And, and I think, I think you're right. I think like one of the things that's definitely holding back is, and we talked a little bit last week in the podcast, it's like, you know, how do we grow the sport more and, and how do we make things better? It's like, it has to be entertaining for people to watch it, but it has to also be done well. Like you're never watching the NFL and the game just goes black. Yeah. It never freezes and the ball's in the air. Like where there's literally t- events at times where like someone will be deadlifting and it just freezes at your knees. And I was like, well, and five minutes later it kicks in and you're like, what just happened? Mm-hmm. Um, and then the problem is you're watching it on lifting cast or on um, good lift 
and you see the lift come up and you know what's happening, but the live stream's not with it. And it gets a little bit weird. So I think that's a big one. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm surprised with on the streams that they, they don't even do simple stuff. Like when they show the attempts, like show it in kilos and pounds, right? Because right. Most, most people watching at home, they don't know what kilo, like what's 300 kilos. Right. Like, like we know, cause we, we load it all the time, but right. you know, the average person doesn't understand, um, especially in America, right? Like we don't use it for, right. kilos for anything. And, um, yeah, like the, the announcers, I think is huge. Like I watched um, Masters Worlds, I think from two years ago, mm-hmm. and I'm into it, and it bored it bored me. I was like, yeah, you know, I, I I don't know. They just need to get people who are passionate about it. I think to announce. Yeah, and like I said, well, but we were talking about it last week, and we were saying like it's that weird line of like, are we a sport or are we sport entertainment? And I I think we kind of yeah. go back and forth on that line. Like you know, I'm not saying that we're WWE. But we probably need to be a little bit more like that to draw a little bit more in. But at the same time, like, you know, if you're talking about the NFL, like, you look down at the screen and all the time it's got every little stat that you can possibly think of. And like I said, a lot of times we don't even get the lights up. Yeah. So you're watching, you're watching it at home and, like, the person walks off the platform and you don't know if it was a good lift or not. You have to go back to lifting cast to look at lifting cast to see if they got it. Yeah. And, like, that's a problem. Um, you know, that should be something that we can hopefully simply fix. Um, and like I said, like having in kilos in pounds, having announcers big, you know, we've got Gino coming in Saturday. Um, yeah. but even, but even with that is that we've run into problems with when he's announcing in the gym, everyone knows what's going on. It's great in the gym, but for whatever reason, and again, this is in my world, he, he's had some problems with the microphones picking up on the live stream to the point where we actually killed the volume on him on the live stream because it was causing more problems and it was helping. Right. Yeah. But now you're watching a live stream, which is almost in silence. <laughs> and that's not fun either. Yeah. So it's trying to, you know, I think there's a lot involved. Um, and I think, I think SPD with the Sheffield is really trying to build that out more. But it's, the problem is that's just one big meet a year. I think we need to do that all the way through the local level. But it's also like, it's expensive. You know, I was saying to these guys last week, like the amount of money that I put into a live stream, you know, could have easily bought a whole new set of Alico equipment. Yeah. You know, yeah. at the end of the day, it's like, do I, yeah, what would I rather have Alico equipment or a bunch of whole, a bunch of new cameras and mics? And it's like, rather have the Alico, but <laughs> you know, the live stream is going to, I think it's going to help uh, bring more people in. So we got to do better at that too. Yeah. That makes sense. Also the podcast. I feel like cameras and mics help with that too. I'm I don't know. Just I, this mic on. I am just sitting terrible. here. I put a camera in. It's all choppy. I don't know. <laughs> I should just no, use my sound, phone you, this week. You sound great. <laughs> Camera we'll on see. Much, but <laughs> we'll, we'll see on the on the actual recording though. So, <laughs> um, I bought this camera like five hours ago, so it should work better than this. Um, <laughs> I don't. I mean, I think I, that's it from. I think for me, Bryce. I do you have anything else? No, I think we could. Uh, we should definitely do another time when we have you back and we talk a little more about uh, training in the gym and everything. Yeah, um, for sure. I'm sure we could talk about a lot more about stuff. Yeah. I'm always ready to sit here and listen more. So, you know, <laughs> right, that's what I do. Great, great listener. Um, <laughs> Mike, is there anything you want to say before we check out? Uh, no. Uh, just going to keep put, putting the work in and see if I can uh, get a podium spot in the Open Nationals in March. And uh, that's it. Is there a place where we could follow you on the social medias? Yeah, no, on Instagram, it's mgarozo. Underscore S. I mean, you don't post that often, though. I post stories usually, and then like, yeah. If, if if I had a big PR, I'll post a. I'll, I'll make yeah. a real post, but I don't know. Um, yeah, I have I have like personal and lifting stuff all mixed with like my Instagram, so I don't like I feel weird like spamming people with lifting stuff all the time, but I don't <laughs> know. That's fine. Yeah. But uh, no, yeah, like you can check out Mike. He's got his shirt on SMG Powerlifting in Briarcliff Manor, New York. Um, Mike, thanks for coming on, and yeah, we'll have you on again if you if you'll be on again. Yeah, definitely. Thank you guys. It was fun. Cool. All right. <laughs>